President Biden wears his Irish Catholic heritage on his sleeve, a fact that will be on full display during his visit to Ireland this coming week. The trip marks the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement that ended violence in Northern Ireland. But it is also a personal visit. Biden plans to see two counties where he has family roots. So while Biden is expected to talk diplomacy and economics, there's a very good chance he also cites the great Irish poets William Butler Yeats and Seamus Heaney along the way. After all, Biden quotes Irish poets so often, he has a joke about it. They always used to kid me because I am always quoting Irish poets on the floor of the Senate, Biden said at a White House event in honor of the singer Elton John. They think I did it because I'm Irish. That's not the reason. I do it because they're the best poets in the world. Biden tells this joke a lot, usually right before quoting some more Irish poetry. Dan Clucci, who was a senior presidential speechwriter in the early part of the Biden administration, said sometimes Biden would ask his speechwriters to include a stanza from Heaney or Yeats. Other times the writers would just proactively do it, knowing the president would want it. And sometimes if there wasn't any Irish poetry written into the speech, Biden would just toss some in from memory on the fly. I wouldn't say that he exclusively quotes Irish poets, Clucci said. But I think you're probably looking at a ratio of at least a 90 to 10 scenario. A deep connection to W.B. Yeats. Biden frequently returns to a line from Easter, 1916 by Yeats. All changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born, the poem goes. It is about a failed uprising in Ireland's fight for independence from Great Britain, but Biden has applied it to an America divided, a changing world, the aftermath of wildfires in California and to mark the Jewish High Holy Days. And yes, it appeared in many Senate floor speeches. But that is far from the only Yates line that Biden has at the tip of his tongue. Think where man's glory most begins and ends and say, my glory was I had such friends, Biden recited at a White House event honoring the Irish rock band U2. Biden added that those are words that echo from an island close to my heart as a descendant of County Mayo and County Louth. Biden's ancestors left Ireland during the famine to come to the U.S. on what were known as coffin ships, because so many people died on the journey. Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923 for giving expression to the spirit of a whole nation. For Biden, the compulsion to quote his words runs deep. During a CNN town hall in 2020, Biden described himself as a child using his Uncle Ed Finnegan's book of Yeats as he worked to overcome his stutter. I'd get up in the night, in the middle of the night, with a flashlight, and I'd look in the mirror and I would try to memorize what I could, Biden said. He would stare at his face, concentrating hard not to contort it when he got caught on a word. In a way Biden found his own voice through Yeats. But it was a different Nobel Prize-winning poet and playwright whom Biden quoted as he accepted the Democratic Party's nomination for president in August 2020. When Hope and History Rhyme The Irish poet Seamus Heaney once wrote, History says don't hope on this side of the grave, but then once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme, Biden said at the convention. Biden connected the writing to his campaign, saying that it was America's moment to make hope and history rhyme, with passion and purpose. Biden isn't the first or the only politician to quote that passage from Heaney's play The Cure at Troy. Then-President Bill Clinton notably did so in Northern Ireland in 1995 to support the peace process. But Biden may well be the politician who quotes those lines the most. That portion of the cure at Troy, I think for him is a touchstone, said Clucci, the speechwriter. I think it's one of those things. Not only the president is like this, but so many leaders are like this when they've found the perfect way of expressing a certain feeling, there's no improving on it, which it's hard for me to argue with that. During his trip, Biden will mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, a 1998 peace accord that brought an end to decades of religious and ethnic violence in Northern Ireland. 
The Cure at Troy premiered in 1990 in the midst of the Troubles. It was an adaptation of a Sophocles play set in the Trojan War, but it clearly was meant to speak to a divided Ireland, said Cahira Doherty, the arts and travel editor for The Irish Voice. As a young man, he attended the premiere of the play. No matter how deeply stuck you feel, your country and a war might be, there is always the possibility that you can snatch some kind of hope or future or possible way forward, O'Doherty said of the play's message. O'Doherty said he's been in many a room when a politician starts talking about hope and history rhyming and everyone just rolls their eyes. But he sees Biden as someone who has lived a life of great joy and great sorrow in the Irish way, something that is given voice by the great Irish poets. It may be a reflex, but I think it is heartfelt, O'Doherty said of Biden's frequent citations of Irish poetry. I think that it steers him and steadies him. And it's something that he reaches for the way that the Irish people do themselves. We reach for the poets when language fails us, when history fails us, when we feel that there's no path forward. The, the engagement with the, I mean, frankly, the people of violence was, was important. For the first time, the British government was engaging openly with Irish Republicans, the Irish government holding meetings with loyalists. There were a good few. There were, there were secret. Um, they, they were secret. There were, uh, you know, even very few of my officials would have known that I had those, those, those meetings. Um, in fact, one of them is in a venue and I still can't find a venue. Um, so it was so secret I can't find a venue myself. <laughs> How does a Taoiseach disappear from their own delegation to go and meet with loyalists? Um, it, it, with great difficulty. <laughs> Much of the groundwork had been done by Mo Molum, her no-nonsense approach rather unconventional for a Northern Ireland secretary. Mo's contribution was, was immense because she was a, a complete culture shock. And, you know, I mean, for those of us who had lived through successive very conservative looking, very conservative, big C and small C looking men who, who were secretaries of state for Northern Ireland. I mean, you know, a lot of them decent folk, but, you know, they, they were archetypal British politicians. And suddenly in steps Mo, um, who was the complete opposite. It was that effort to engage. Like it's, it's so, we've all seen a lot of secretary of state come and go. And it was hard to see someone that would come in and plonk the legs up on the table and throw the hairpiece off and bang the table and kick doors and you know, <laughs> it was unusual to say the least. And the world's media descended on Northern Ireland in anticipation. The deal was on, then off, then hanging in the balance. The last sort of 24, 36 hours, apart from a wee bit of tidying up that had to be done at, a, at our end, it was, it was waiting for David Trimble. That, that's my sort of recollection. And I don't say that in any disparaging way. He had a, a, a big challenge. So it wasn't really uh, until his death and I saw a lot of the, the footage of the battle within unionism that I, I, I realized that uh, you know, he, was, he was up against it. Nationalist leader John Hume had got Sinn Féin to the table. David Trimble's task to keep the Ulster unionists there.